Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I, I am not Pastor Alex, um, but uh, he did ask me to speak or say something today. Um, today's Torah portion is Kitisa. It's uh, Exodus, let's see, 30, 11 through 34, 35. Um, and when Pastor asked me to uh, speak or teach, uh, kind of had some questions and some doubts within myself whether or not I'm even in a position to teach or um, speak for him or anything like that. And uh, ultimately, it, it came down to um, there's a lot that goes into teaching. There's a lot that uh, is required of someone who calls themselves a teacher. Um, and I, myself, am not really in that position um, but what I can do is, you know, give myself, give my testimony and, and share how it relates to our Torah portion. Um, and just to, to have some encouragement for everyone who um, is here. And uh, so the first thing that popped in my mind when kind of figuring out, well, what am I to say? Um, and when I figured out it should be my testimony um, was Revelation 12, um, 10 and 11. And uh, that passage, uh, and I'll be reading out of uh, the KJV just because that's kind of what I read out of, and so I don't want anybody to get offended. Uh, but <laughs> in verses uh, 10 and 11, it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Um, so this is in the end times, but what stood out to me was they overcame uh, Satan um, by the blood of the Lamb and by the power of their testimony. So each and every one of us have that opportunity to live out our testimony and give our testimony and it being very powerful. Um, we are examples of Yeshua on this um, earth and what we do resonates. If we're living in a certain way and we're saying that we believe something and it doesn't line up, no one's going to want to follow what you follow or believe what you believe. So um, our testimonies can be very powerful. Um, so where I started in coming to Torah and all of this was around 2016, but growing up, I grew up in a Christian fundamental Baptist, uh, family. So I always grew up going to church, um, whether it was when I was very little and being taken there or, you know, growing up Sunday school, all, all this stuff. Um, but in 2016, I had a buddy of mine. Uh, from college, who ended up calling me out of the blue when I was walking into work, and he just posed a question on, are we supposed to be doing certain things? And um, I was working at the airport at the time, so it kind of, he, he, I was going into work, he kind of threw out that question, and it just stuck in my brain. And so a little bit after that time, I think it was like a week week and a half later, I ended up fly, flying out to visit him, and we spent pretty much one whole day uh, listening to some teachings, just researching some stuff, and it was a pretty pivotal time where that happened, just because it started throwing the question on, what do I really believe, and why do I believe what I believe at the time that I believe it? Um, so, you know, Christian Sunday, you know, we go to church, but the questions on what are we supposed to do in certain situations, or is this right, is this wrong, is very gray, because they don't have the Torah as a standard. Um, so, when that was presented to me on, there is a right, there is an absolute truth, and there is wrong, what are we going to do with it? Or when you're presented with that, what are you going to do? Um, so 
we did the typical stuff, whether it was, you know, Christmas, Easter, all this stuff, traditions, um, this is what we did. But as we see in this Torah portion uh, is the Torah portion of the golden calf. And so that stuck out to me because in uh, 32, 1 through 6, Exodus 32, 1 through 6, we have the golden calf incident. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which go, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off their golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, fashioned it with the graving tool, and after he had made it a molded calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation, and said, Tomorrow is a feast to Jehovah. And they rose up early on the morrow, and brought burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink, and rose up to play. And Going through Exodus, we know that they were told not to make any graven images and all this stuff that was already laid before them. But to them, they were doing this to the Lord. They were doing this to Yahweh. Um, And when that was presented to me on what we were doing at the time, it didn't matter if you're doing it for the Lord. If you're not doing what's right, it doesn't matter. You You can have a sincerity in oh, I'm doing this for him, but that doesn't matter because we see what ha- ends up at, uh, for the people. They're, they're judged. The, it, it, there's a right and there's a wrong. And that, knowing that there's an absolute truth because, you know, either going to college, dealing with atheists or whoever you're dealing with, we can stand firm in the scriptures in knowing yes and no, right and wrong, and and being able to stand knowing that the creator of the universe, you know, is behind us. So, all these things coming up to mind, holidays, oh yeah, but we're doing it to the Lord, Christmas, we're doing it, we're we're, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, you know, all these things, knowing where they come from, I love history, and you know, you start researching, you start going into what these things mean. You start realizing there's a, there's a discrepancy on what the meaning of this is, what people say that they're doing it for, and what it actually is. Um, so you start, I started just look, looking into it, figuring out what is truth, what is right. Um, and even though I hadn't known about the Torah yet, uh, one thing that I thank my parents for and um, just teaching us was we can tr- trust the scriptures. It's 100% true. This is God's word. Um, it's inerrant and discrepancies or inconsistencies are usually with the reader and not with the word. Um, so that was something that I always grew up with and so researching, figuring it out, the thing that my buddy had asked me was about food. I don't think we're supposed to be eating pork. And I'm Latino, and that's ingrained in our cultures. Um, why not? W- w- what are we supposed to be eating then? What, what about this passage? What about that passage? Um, but looking at it with an open, with an open mind, just because, you know, Growing up, you've been taught certain things, or we were told, uh, you know, if you don't come with the suit jacket on to the church, then we're not going to, you know, you're not going to be a part of it, things like that. And I knew that what they were t- telling me, um, well, that, that's not in the scripture. Um, so, all right, I'm going to look at this and, and actually test it. Let's see if this is the truth. So it started with food. 
Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out here that that's where it started as well. Um, but it did. And uh, it wasn't the, the eating of it. Um, the not eating of it wasn't the hard part. But for me, it was the telling people, telling my parents, telling Carissa and telling her family, um, I'm not going to eat certain things. Oh, why not? Well, because it says in the Bible, it, you're not supposed to eat it. Um, and so that was the first step. The next thing was the Shabbat, which, like I said, whether it's food, that's the next thing that usually comes up to people is what is the Sabbath? What are we supposed to, when are we supposed to be worshiping? And what day are we supposed to hold as the Sabbath? Um, so that was a big step up from, oh, I'm not going to eat this. So, all right, so you're not going to eat it, but now are you going to observe the Sabbath? Like I said, I was working at the airport, and it's not a normal, you know, Monday through Friday. The airport runs 24-7. So I was relatively new at the airport. So shifts were based on a bidding process based on seniority. Uh, I only had like a year in, so I wasn't the lowest, but I'm not going to get Saturday and Sundays off because the old timers are going to get those days off. Um, I end up getting Thursday and Fridays off and working at the airport, they allow you to uh, trade your shifts, you know, post someone's willing to work it. You can give them that shift so you can have multiple days off or you could pick up shifts and work a lot of extra time. Um, and when I decided, you know, the Sabbath, you know, is Friday evening and Saturday evening. Am I going to obey it? Okay, what am I going to do? I have work. <laughs> Saturday, I have, I have work. Um, but y'all provided what I needed, which was I just would post it. It's an electronic board. I would just post up my shift on a Saturday. Um, and every single time, I didn't ask anybody. I, I wasn't going around, will you work for me, things like that, I would just put it up. And every single time, it and ended up getting picked up. Um, whether it was a half shift, or where I could come in at the evening, what, whatever it was, it always ended up getting picked up. And there were some trying times just because uh, it was a Thursday, a Thursday before I'm supposed to go into work, no one has picked up my shift, what am I to do? I go out, service of airplane, and come back, I get a notification, oh, it's picked up. And, you know, it's, it, it was just a blessing because we see in his word, if you're adamant in, o, in your obedience, he will provide what you need. Um, so it's pretty clear cut, especially in this Torah portion, when, when, uh, what the Sabbath is. And uh, we got uh, in uh, chapter 31, 12 through 17, and it, he reiterates the Sabbath. This is something that always comes up in the Torah because it is important. Um, so it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth shall surely be put to death, for whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So, you come across these passages over and over in the Torah, and it, you, you're either going to observe it or you're not. It, it, that's what it comes down to. Um, and in doing so, you're, you're, you're showing the sign. You're showing the sign between you and the God who made this earth. And, and that's, that's important, and it's forever. We see that it, it's perpetual. It, it's, it's not going to change. That was one of the things that, you know, you come in out of Sunday looking at 
is Sunday the Sabbath, is, is Saturday the Sabbath, whatever it is, we get instructions in the beginning of the book that says it's forever. That can't be changed in the latter portion of the book. And so it was something that was always a thing presented to me. Are you going to obey? Are you going to have this? Are you going to, are you going to trust me that the Shabbat, you guys, are you, are you going to rest? And at, as well as being at the airport, uh, and I'm just coming into these things, uh, me and Carissa had been engaged just recently, like six months or so. Um, and so I'm having to tell my family and her that I'm not going to do certain things on Shabbat. I, uh, I got the time off from work, but now what do I do? Am I going to go hang out with Carissa and, and do the things that she was doing at the time, whether it was going to the stores, doing errands, all this stuff? Or am I going to rest? Um, and it, it was a test just because a lot of the planning for an upcoming wedding was being done on Saturday. Um, and it came to a, a, a point where Chris was going to a venue on a Saturday and she wanted me to come. And I, I said, I'm not going to come. She really wanted me to come. Oh, I was, okay but I'm not going to do anything, I said. And so I sat down, and not, I didn't even speak a word. <laughs> and uh, the lady who was helping Chris, uh, you know, showing all the things or whatever, you know, asked if I was okay. I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And that was pretty much it. Um, and then after that day, I was, you know what, Chris, uh, I, I can't come with you to these things. I don't feel comfortable doing this, uh, and this is the reason why. Um, and so... You know, thank God, Carissa did her research as well. I presented why and what I did, and she did her research, and she came to the same conclusion. Um, but at, at the time, we didn't even know if we were going to get married anymore just because there were drastic changes in what I was doing and what I believed. Um, and so when given that... Uh, that opportunity to, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to be doing, you know, are you okay with that, uh, you know, y'all worked in her heart to, to come and arrive at the same conclusions that we did, and at that point, you know, the uh, opposition to uh, have a wedding or do all that stuff, they, it went away, because Y'all empowered her to have the strength to get it done six days out of the week. And on the seventh day, you know, rest. So it, 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 it was something that, you know, was proven to us over and over again to the point where this is what we're going to do because he's proven himself faithful and we should prove ourselves faithful in that. Um, so it also talks about in this portion the uh, the workmen that helped, uh, I think, uh, Aholiab, um, Bezalel, and in uh, Exodus 31, um, let's see, Exodus 31, 1 through 11, it talks about the workmen. Uh, specifically, verses 3 and 5, it says, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold, and in silver, and in brass, and in cutting of stones, and to set them, and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. So, with obedience, it's Yah himself who will empower his workmen. He's going to give us what we need to get the job done. And that's something that we all need to remember. Um, because in obedience, you see him faithful. And he empowers you to obey. There's trials and tribulations of this life that come, but he doesn't give us anything that we can't trust in him and obey. We have that option to obey or disobey in everything. And nothing is going to come up 
in our lives where we can't obey, we always have the option to obey. And, and he proves himself faithful every single time. Um, so, now, moving forward, as uh, we started eating, started obeying the Shabbat, started the, the feast days, trying to learn about them, trying to observe them in the manner in which I knew how, coming fresh into it, however it was. Um, the next part was now, uh, how, how do I explain what I'm doing in a loving manner? Because when you come up, come into this uh, knowing a certain thing, but then being shown, no, that's not right. This is right. You know, the Torah, having that guideline. You know, you start looking at other people and be like, you're doing it wrong. You want, you want, you want, kind of want to grab them, shake them, like, can't you see it says clearly right here what to do? Um, and so that was tough for me just because, you know, I want these people, my loved ones, to see it the way I see it. It's clear to me. But in how you do it matters as well. Um, you can't yell at someone and them ex- and you expect them to be like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. I, I want to I join the guy who's yelling, you know. Um, but, <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of what happened. And so um, it took time to learn how to let someone know that I think you're wrong. Take a look at this, examine this, and, and we can discuss it. Because um, we, we get told by, by Paul, right, that, you know, if you have all this stuff, but you don't have love, what, what does it matter? Um, and so being, being in a position to share the truth in a loving manner, in a manner in which people will receive does so much more than yelling at someone, shaking them, get it right. Um, and then, you know, you have to know who you're talking to as well. And if someone is presented with something over and over again, you know, there comes a point where you have to be, no, you know, be firm. But, you know, learning how to explain uh, what I believe in a, in a loving manner was pretty much the next step. And uh, we... In doing so, we uh, we fall, right? We we learn new things. I shouldn't have been doing this that way. I not I need to regroup myself. I need to you know repent and come back and do it the correct way. Whether it's something that you're being presented in, out of the scriptures, or whether it's you know um, you 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 slip, you mess up, um, but we see um, in this portion the, the part of the, the bronze basin um, in Exodus 30, uh, 17 to 21, we, uh, we have the bronze um, basin. Let's see. And the Lord sp- spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a, la- a laver of brass, and the foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. Um, And when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not, or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not, and it shall be a statue forever to them, even to him and his seed throughout their generations. Uh, we have Yeshua in John 14 that uh, gives us an example with the, uh, the Last Supper when he washes the disciples' feet. So, or John 13, uh, 1 through 11. Now before the feast of, pa- of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil have, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, 
Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherein he was girded. Then come, cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, does thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not to say to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who shall betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So we see that Yeshua says, you know, those who are washed don't need to be washed thoroughly like Peter wanted. Um, save only your feet. And in this walk that we live, you know, we strive to follow Yeshua's example. We want to do what he did. We want to walk before our God uh, blameless, upright, and that comes with walking through this world. And we're going we're gonna to get stuff on our feet. We're gonna, but we've been washed. We've been cleansed. And while we walk through this world, we need to wash our feet with the word. And uh, we get another verse talking about this in Ephesians. Um, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Um, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so that's how we're supposed to be. Every day, we are, the, the priests would, before entering, would wash themselves, getting themselves ready to do the work that was laid before them. And that's the same thing that is presented to us every day. We have to get ourselves ready and wash ourselves with the word, preparing ourselves for the work that's in front of us. And the reason why it says right here that he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the word by the word, washing of water by the word, and present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. And that's how we're, we're supposed to be. Um, it, it can be a struggle living out your daily life. It can get mundane or it can get very hectic. No matter what, we are to wash ourselves. We are to be blameless before him and be presentable so that when he comes, we are not the ones who are trying to hide and having the mountains fall on us, but we're going to be there excited at his coming. Um, so after you know all these things coming into Torah, Doing, doing the feast, doing the Sabbaths, eating correctly, now learning how to present Torah in a way that's loving, that people can see Yeshua through us. We now need to make sure that we are set apart. We're his holy people. We need to be blameless before him. And that's just the daily task of his assembly, his called out ones. Um, because if... if we don't, we see, we see what happens, and it happens in this Torah portion as well, right? Um, you have Moses who pleads for the people who have sinned, and he goes before uh, Yah in uh, verses uh, 31 through 35 of chapter 32. Um, he says, and Moses returned unto the Lord, and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, 
out of the book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore, now go lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, my angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. So, we see that the results of sin and disobedience is serious. He says that he will blot them out of the book. And if, if that doesn't give us pause to look at the situation, whatever situation we're in, and be like, I can either obey and be blessed, however he has it, because he said obedience brings out a blessing, or not, and sin, we see the consequences of that sin. It, it, it's serious. And in the end, what will come of you? His wrath and his destruction. Um, so that's why we have a, a encouragement. Um, because when we choose to call Yahweh our Elohim, our God, we're going to obey what he says. Um, it comes with a price. Um, and Yeshua speaks to that in uh, Luke 14. Luke 14, 25 to 33. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he has able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador desiring conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Me personally, when coming into this, at the very start of it, like I said, Chris and I weren't on the same page, but it came with the choice with, there's someone that I love. There's someone that I plan to get married to. Am I willing to present what I now know to her, even if it means that she's not going to want to get married anymore? You know, and, and not everyone's going to be put into that position. But when you decide and choose that you're going to obey, it's going to come with something. You are going to have to give everything up for his name. Because he wants a people who are holy after him. He wants our hearts, all of it. We can't have a portion of it, one foot in, one foot out. We see in Revelation the lukewarm church who he spits out. So it comes with a forsaking of everything to obey. And, and you individually, me, and what I still, every single day, you have to count the cost. Now I'm not at the airport anymore, but I'm, in, I'm an electrician and I'm in construction. And so you see these companies, general contractors, having the funds, the plans to build something. And I've also been on a job where they don't know what they want anymore. It comes to the end of a project and they, oh, we want this here. We want, you know, all these things. And history has shown us that certain contractors will go broke building a certain building. They, they have collapsed. And so I get to see a physical example of knowing the cost it is to build something 
And what we're building is the body of Messiah. That's what we're building. And you have to be willing and ready, count the cost, and give all that you have for that. Um, and so the last thing uh, I wanted to, the last passage I wanted to read was um, in Exodus 34, 5 through 7. Um, we have Moses who goes up to the mountain again, and he asks to see Yahweh, his face. Um, and this is what ends up happening. Um, let's see. Five through seven. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, children unto the third and to the fourth generation. This is who we serve. This is our creator. This is our Elohim. He, he is abundant in mercy, gracious, long-suffering. However, there comes consequences for sin. He will come back, and he will judge. And we need to prepare ourselves every single day, get ourselves ready, because if you're not, you're going to be the ones terrified at his coming. And if you are ready, then we're going to be so happy when we see him coming down. Um, and that's, and that's just uh, what was laid on my heart to to speak, to share with you guys. Um, that everyone has their story. Everyone has their story on how they came to Torah and why why they believe this. Um, but I also want to encourage everyone that we need to remain faithful. These people that we see. Uh, in Exodus, the children of Israel that come out of Egypt who are given his instructions, who see many miracles, all but two <laughs> didn't, didn't make it. You know, and, and just because you come into this, if you're not willing to give it all up and to obey him wholly, then you're not going to make it either. You know, so be Be ready. Be encouraged that he will take care of you in, in obedience, but understand the cost, you know. So, uh, pastor usually lands a 777, but I think the 747 is a little bit cooler because it has two decks to it. Um, but we, let's pray and we'll uh, finish up today. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the time um, that you give to us on Shabbat. Uh, we have a fellowship here for people to um, come together and, and worship you. Um, we pray for Pastor Alex uh, that you would be with him, that you would heal him, um, and that you would give him the strength that he needs. Um, I just thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak and uh, that everything that was said would be for your honor and your glory. We pray for the rest of the uh, the day that you would be with everyone here, that you would refresh them as you say that you will for your Shabbat and that um, everything that we say and our conversations today, the food that, we, that we're going to have, you would bless it to our bodies and just allow us to um, just make the most out of what you've given to us. We pray all this in the name of your son, Yeshua. Amen. Amen. So I think that's it.
Bye. 